All right, hi, we're going to take a quick introductory look at the supply curve, obviously, pairing it up with the demand curve eventually to look at market equilibrium. But just to get the, uh, the foundation down, um, and a lot of the terminology here is basically going to be borrowed from our discussion of demand and from the production possibility frontier. So a lot of familiar topics here, um, but our basic definition when we think of supply in the context of a market equilibrium model, it's always going to be a mathematical relationship right here between price per unit and number of units supplied by a producer. Right? Holding all other factors constant right so it's recognizing that yes other things besides price goes into determining how many units are supplied, but we're just focusing on that kind of X Y two variable relationship here. And when we talk about supply, again, most of the time we'll be sketching it out as a graph, but we can also portray this relationship as a mathematical function or a so-called supply schedule, a table of values. And we should be able to translate one to the other. So since our definition here is a relationship between price and quantity supplied, let's be specific about exactly what we mean by those terms. From the point of view of a supplier, when we talk about price, it can really mean two different things. The kind of obvious interpretation, right, that it's going to be the market price per unit for which, which the seller can receive at the point of sale. So actually representing the revenue gained per unit sold. We can also think of it as representing the marginal cost of producing one additional unit. Therefore, it's going to represent the minimum acceptable price to the seller. So you're going to have to meet that cost per unit in order to induce the seller to go through the trouble of producing and selling that unit. Okay. So it depends, again, on the the context of how we're reading a supply schedule or a supply function, which interpretation is going to be most useful. On the quantity side of the equation, right, borrowing the notation right from demand where we represented quantity as Q sub D, quantity demanded here Q sub S, number of units produced per unit of time at a specific price. So we can think of it as an answer to an if then statement, right? If you offer me this price, this is the number of units that I'll be able to supply, the maximum number that I'll be able to produce. So this brings us back to, again, familiar territory from the production possibility frontier model, right? Which of course was all about the capabilities of a producer to create output. So the quantity supplied, the number of units of a particular product that, that we're capable of producing is going to be a function of availability of resources, land, labor, capital, and our efficiency, our ability to combine those resources, right? our production technology. So we can, when we think of the production possibility frontier, right, shifting out or shifting in, we can also think of it as affecting a firm's quantity supply, how many units they'd be able to produce if offered a specific price in return. The other thing, of course, that we take away from the production possibility frontier model is as we move along that function, we noticed, of course, that right, it's a downward sloping relationship between quantities in two different, two competing sectors. So if you're asking a firm to produce more, to increase output by one additional unit, well, there's going to be a cost associated with that measured in units sacrificed of the alternative good, the opportunity cost. Okay. So what we're getting at here is basically translating that opportunity cost into a dollar value, the price, the revenue received that will compensate for that price. Right. So that's essentially the construction of this supply relationship. Okay. And once we have this relationship in mind, 
what exactly is it going to look like? So you will recall the quote unquote law of demand, right? Which basically just said, we expect the relationship between price and quantity from the point of view of a consumer to be an inverse or negative relationship. The higher the price, the lower the quantity demanded. The corollary to that, the law of supply, of course, is going to flip that around, where we expect a positive upward sloping, if you will, relationship between price and quantity supply. And just like with the law of demand, we want to be careful about being able to explain the intuition of why we expect that to be the case. And just like with demand, there will be two reasons that we'll focus in on. So here, why do we expect price and quantity supplied to move in the same direction? Well, borrowing from, yet again, our production possibility frontier model, we noticed that it was a nonlinear function, right? That as you increased production along one axis, the slope of that trade-off began to steepen, right? That the cost of producing, producing one additional unit increased the more we produced. And we saw that was due to the assumption of specialization of resources. The more of something we do, the more costly, the more difficult, the less efficient that activity becomes as the resources used to produce it are going to be less and less efficient. So if you want a firm to produce more output, it's going to cost the firm more and more to produce those additional units. So the only way they're going to do it is if you offer a higher price, right? So as quantity rises, costs go up, the firm charges a higher price, and those two things are going to go in the same direction. The law of supply, price and quantity are positively correlated. This explanation, this increase in cost explanation, again, borrowed from the PPF, starts, right, the, the causal arrow goes from quantity rising leading to an increase in price. The other way to think about it, what we'll call law of supply reason number two, is if we flip that around. And there's probably a better way to think about this, but um, I always just think about this as the simple profit motive, right? That if you offer a higher price, say consumers have an increase in their willingness to pay, well, if you're able to cover higher costs for the firm, they're therefore going to be willing to produce those units, right? Because of the revenue above cost, profit going up, and that provides the incentive to increase output. So this again flips around that causal arrow. If willingness to pay, if the price offered firms goes up, that will induce them to put more onto the market to increase quantity supplied. Either way you slice it, we're going to end up with something like this, right? A positive upward sloping relationship. So not a uh, super creative example, but one we can all relate to, thinking about the production that comes out of, say, our corner coffee shop, and we're tracking number of cups of coffee produced per day based on the market price. And so we see as price rises at these 50 cent increments, we will see in our example, the ability of the, the ability and willingness of the firm to produce will also be rising here at 20 units, 20 unit increments in quantity supplied per day. So we should be comfortable right, picking a point on that supply curve. I noticed in my slide, we forgot to label that. So put a big S next to the line, indicating it is a supply curve. And we've labeled our axis price and quantity supplied per day. Let's pick a point on that curve, say here, the combination of price of $2 and quantity of 120 units per day. And again, we should be able to put that into two equally true cause effect statements right? or if then statements. So the first one here, if the price offered is $2 per unit, so if the, the coffee shop knew that it could sell a cup of coffee for 
$2 each, the maximum number of units it will be willing and able to produce on a daily basis will be that position of the supply curve, the horizontal position, in this case, 120 units. The other way to think about it is starting at 120 right, and going up, if they produce 120 units, the cost of producing that last unit will be the vertical position of the supply curve. The dollar value height of that curve is the marginal cost, the cost for that last unit. So the 120th unit costs $2 to produce. Each unit before that costs less, right? The line slopes downward. Each unit beyond that is going to cost more. So going back to the first one, why would they stop at 120 units? Why wouldn't they produce 121 units? Well, because the 121st is going to cost them more than $2. So you wouldn't produce something that you, for which you would not be able to recover the cost of production. Right? So once we hit that point, that's where we stop with that break-even point on the last unit produced. So regardless of what the numbers are, again, be comfortable, be confident in picking any point and explaining it in those two different ways. The height represents the cost of production. The horizontal position represents the maximum quantity produced at that given price. So once we have one point on the supply curve fully explained, we should also be comfortable in explaining movements up and down that curve. So starting with the same supply schedule, the same values here, how would we kind of tell the story of a movement from, say, point A to point B? Well, again, we should be familiar now. We're probably going to be able to do this in more than one way. One way to see this is, again, the if-then statement. If consumers increase their willingness to pay from $1.50 up to $2.50, so if we go up, here, the firm will be happy to increase their production from 100 to 140 units. Right? So going up and over gives us that, again, kind of if-then structure. If you offer that high of a price, this will be the maximum additional output I'll be able to produce because I can cover my cost for all these additional units. Right? The other way to think of it, starting from a change in quantity, if the firm increased their quantity from 100 to 140, then the cost of production is going to rise from $1.50 to 250 for the last unit. And therefore, if that's going to happen, they will have to raise their price up to that new point to cover those additional costs. Anytime you see that movement along, it'll have those two, again, equally correct, but competing interpretations. One last thing to consider before we start to put all this together um, is, okay, so our construction here is for the supply offered by a single firm. Well, in order to do much with this uh, in terms of constructing a model to examine resource allocation, scarcity, and market dynamics, we need to aggregate this relationship across all the firms in a particular industry. So we will construct a market supply in exactly the same fashion that we constructed a market demand by the horizontal summation, right? We want to relate the market price to the summation of quantity supplied across all firms in the industry every firm producing the same product, either in the same geographic location or making their product available to the same consumers. So we'll think about this total or aggregation of output as this summation. Again, the notation is probably more than we need to deal with, but as a technical aspect, right? So we're going to be adding up, we're going to be summing quantities supplied for individual firms. So the index J represents an individual firm, and J will go from the first firm to the last firm. So that M 
represents the total number of firms. Okay. But again, all we're basically saying is asking each firm, say asking every coffee shop in the market, if you could sell coffee for a dollar a cup, how many cups would you produce? We jot that down for firm one, we jot it down for firm two, and we add it all up. And then we come back and say, if you could charge $1.50, how many would you produce? We jot that down for each firm, we add it all up, and ultimately we'll get this function, this price quantity relationship representing total output in the industry. Basically what I just did is this. So let's imagine a super simple case where again, we have our little coffee shop market, but instead of one firm, we have three firms. So set M equal to three. And looking at the numbers in our example, we can see exactly how the construction of this horizontal summation would happen. So using the same prices that we saw for the first individual firm, and that'll show up here as firm one, and say we have two competing firms, at the price of a dollar, firm one would produce 80, firm two would produce 60, firm three would produce 50 units, add all that up, and we get the quantity supplied for the market at the price of a dollar of 190. As the price rises, each firm is going to be following that law of supply, increasing their production, and we add those terms up and we see that total summation here. So we plot that out and we would get again, the market supply. So a good start, a good introduction. What we'll look at next is shifting that supply curve, then connecting it up with demand and market equilibrium. Then we'll have our foundation for basically everything else we'll do in terms of microeconomic uh, analysis. So thank you very much for your attention.